Before we get started with this program, I first want to take a moment to acknowledge that wherever you're calling in from, you are on Indigenous land. At Mohai, we're on the historic and contemporary lands and waters of the Duwamish, Suquamish, and all Coast Salish people. The Duwamish, Suquamish, and Coast Salish people were forcefully removed, but we honor their endurance today with deep respect and gratitude for their stewardship of this place. To this day, the Duwamish people have yet to receive federal recognition. We encourage you to visit the Duwamish Longhouse, which is in West Seattle and has a new exhibit that just opened recently to learn more and um, continue to grapple with the past in ways that will help us better shape our future as a community. It is now my pleasure to introduce our moderator for the evening, Jackie Peterson. Jackie Peterson is a museum consultant with expertise in ex exhibition development, curation, and writing for cultural institutions. With over a decade of exhibits experience, she has worked nationally with museums, communities, and stakeholders. Jackie's recent work has focused on exhibitions highlighting the experiences of African Americans in Washington State. Thank you so much for being our moderator this evening. Thank you so much, Rachel, for that wonderful welcome. I am really excited to kick off this program this evening. Uh, again, my name is Jackie Peterson. I use she, her pronouns. I am a black woman with uh, medium tan skin, dark brown eyes, uh, just above shoulder length, coily dark brown hair. And I'm beaming in from my home office. So you'll see some fun colored throw pillows, a sofa and some picture artwork on the wall behind me. So I'm partially really excited for this conversation tonight because in thinking about history and how we want to remember sort of big events uh, that we've all experienced, it's always interesting to hear about how people approach that, how we think about memory and how we want to really document and record some of the lessons and insights that we've received from this really uh, emotional and turbulent time um, that we're all experiencing right now. And so I'm really excited uh, that the panelists that are joining this evening, uh, I'm excited for them to share a little bit about their experiences. Uh, we've got a really diverse representation of different uh, historical organizations around the Seattle area. And uh, this is just gonna be a really wonderful conversation. So I'm gonna invite each of our panelists to introduce themselves. I always find that fun and how people like to introduce themselves. So uh, I'll start with uh, Clara from Mo. Hi, I'm Clara Berg. I'm the curator of collections at Mohai. So I work with the 3D artifacts and worked a lot on COVID collecting this past year, year plus. Um, I'm a white woman. I have a shoulder length blonde hair. Um, I'm wearing a cranberry sweater and some large teal earrings. I always, I'm always afraid of wearing big earrings with masks. I'm going to rip them out. And so I feel like Zoom, I'm always like, yes, I'm going to wear big earrings on Zoom. Um, and I'm in my living room and I have a very swirly painting behind me. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to Taya next. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. My name is Teofila Cruz Uribe. Um, everyone calls me Taya. I use she, her pronouns. And I am the director of the CIMAR Museum of Chicano Chicana Latino Latina Culture. I'm also the health center administrator for the CIMAR Adolescent Medical Clinic located in the South Park neighborhood. Um, I'm a Latina woman. I have dark brown hair and brown eyes. Uh, and I am wearing a black top and I am in my office right now at the Seymour Museum and Adolescent Clinic, but my backdrop is a photo of uh, Latinx high school students uh, holding a banner promoting the opening of the Seymour Museum. Uh, this was done during a parade um, at one of our Fiestas Patrias uh, events in 2018, right before the museum opened. Excellent. Thank you, Tay. And next we'll go to Charlotte. Hi, I'm Charlotte Bell. I'm so honored to be here. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the deputy director of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation Discovery Center. I am a middle-aged white woman with dark shoulder length hair, and I'm wearing a green uh, top with a pinkish scarf. And I'm standing virtually in front of uh, some exhibits at the Discovery Center that is also not open at this time. Um, that has a lot of wood panels in the background. 
Great, thank you, Charlotte. And last but absolutely not least, uh, Stephanie. Hello, everyone. I'm Stephanie Johnson Tolliver, and I'm the president of the Black Heritage Society of Washington State. I'm a black woman, dark hair, glasses. I'm wearing a black and white shawl tonight, and I'm sitting in my living room coming to you from the Central District of Seattle, Washington. Wonderful. I am so excited to speak with you all this evening. And so just to give uh, our attendees a quick rundown of how our conversation will go, uh, I will be moderating and asking questions. Uh, our panelists will respond. Uh, they have lots to share. They have lots to share with each other. It'll be a, a really great exchange. And then uh, we'll start to wrap up our conversation here and then open it up to questions uh, from our attendees uh, right about the 7, 10, 15 mark, uh, just for those of you who are keeping track of time. So uh, without further ado, we'll get started. Um, so I think some of us, uh, some of us recognize that we were going to be in it for the long haul when we first heard about the COVID pandemic. And uh, some of us didn't really know what, what hit us uh, and thought maybe a couple of months we're gonna be in this, maybe not. So I'm curious uh, for all of you thinking about how your organization first reacted when you realized, oh my goodness, this pandemic is not gonna go away. It's not gonna go away anytime soon. Uh, and I'm wondering what are some of the first things that came to your mind or some of the early conversations that you began to have about documenting uh, what was going on in the pandemic and within your communities? So uh, Stephanie, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, sure. Well, wow, that's a big one because, you know, as an organization whose mission it is to collect the history of black people, significant places and events, it's uh, it actually occurred to us that BHS, we should hurry up and listen mm -hmm. and document um, all of the stories, you know, that have impacted the, the community. And we could see how other organizations were hurrying to do that too. Mm -hmm. So who better to collect our stories, uh, the black stories of black community, but BHS. So um, yeah, we thought we better hurry up and get going. But uh, we tried a couple times to gauge interest and it was like, oh, yikes. You know, mm. people were just not ready. They weren't mm -hmm. ready, they were angry, frustrated. There were history triggers about vaccines and testing of black folks and mm -hmm. you know, the restrictions for gathering um, you know, was picking up. And so, you know, how would you collect these stories? You know, our, particularly in the black community, um, the center of our spirituality and our churches were all closed and yeah. so, people were just not ready to process it and, and talk about it. So we stepped back to be more of a listener hmm. than a collector. Thank you, thank you. I imagine that was kind of a reality check. Um, I think, you know, so many of us, especially those of us who do oral histories very frequently, we're so used to talking to our communities regularly. And uh, I think it must've been, um, just, yeah, an interesting reality check about, oh, we can't just sort of jump in and approach this in the same way that we used to. Exactly. Yeah, it raised a question about, you know, language, the, the term mm. collecting and even the term documenting, you know, collecting has, you know, there's a lot of, you know, decolonization work behind the, just the term collecting, but even the term mm -hmm. documenting is, it's clinical. Um, and that, so that's just a, that's a big picture debate about, you know, if we're not collecting and if documenting isn't what people think that they're doing, what are they doing with, with the stories and their experiences and how can we mm. help them with those experiences? That's the biggest question that was raised by when I learned the theme of, of tonight's <laughs> History Cafe, you know, documenting and collecting the pandemic. What does that mean? What will that look like? Mm -hmm. And were, were there any words or language or things that felt resonant within the folks that you were talking to, Taya? Did anything come up? Um, you know, the documenting, it was the word that was used more. Um, mm -hmm. 
and partially that's because I, you know, where I straddle the healthcare field as well as the cultural and heritage field. Um, and documenting is, is, is a clinical term that, that we use and it's what we do ongoing. And, you know, the medical records are, are documenting the pandemic. So, you know, the documentation mm -hmm. is happening, um, but experiences are also happening and how those experiences are, are being collected, how they're being remembered and how they're being shared. That's the, that's the big question, how, how to gather those, how to, how to, open people up how to you know have people realize yeah. that they have a voice and do they want to share it they may not want to share it as, as stephanie said you know there's reluctance at certain stages you know we're still in the pandemic and mm -hmm. you can't you know sometimes you can't see the storm you're in and you can't you can't have insight into it you can have some insight and certain kinds of insight but other insight is is only going to come with time or with a different perspective or from an outside view Mm. Those the big questions come about just just by looking at the language of collecting yeah. the pandemic, documenting the pandemic. Yeah, thank you for that, Clara. Yeah, I was good. I I feel like um, in the museum field, we always want to do contemporary collecting. It's like you know we we're used you know people most of our donations that come in are about fifty years old. People think we want old stuff, and we're always sort of trying to figure out how to be more contemporary with our collecting. So I think initially. The early part of the pandemic, it was like, I mean, obviously exciting is the wrong word, but it was like, it, it's helpful when it's clear that it's an important moment in history. Like, like, okay, this is important. We should collect this. It's clear. This is great. We know what we know. We know what we need to collect. I'm not saying it's good. There's pandemic. Um, but that, but then of course, as soon as we started doing it, we're like, oh, this is why collecting is hard. Contemporary stories, even when it's clear, this is historically important, even when it's clear this yes. is the moment that we should be collecting, you know, people aren't ready. I, you know, that, that we're in the middle of it. And also that, you know, of course, a lot of us thought it was going to be this sort of short thing. So what part of the story do you collect and how many different experiences? And it pretty quickly was a, a wake up call of that just because we know it's significant doesn't make it any easier to collect. Mm. Yeah, that's a great point. And, and to, remind ourselves even sometimes that it wasn't just the COVID-19 pandemic that's happening, like so many other major things were happening uh, within the last 18 months. We had a presidential election. There were, you know, uprisings across the country over police brutality uh, against folks of color and black folks specifically. And there are all these things happening in the world that kind of compounded um, just the, the COVID-19 pandemic. So we can't necessarily think of it in isolation. And Charlotte, I think, go ahead. Sure, yeah. And I think for us, it was less about collecting stories, but rather whose voices aren't being heard and what stories can we rise to the surface that really show how communities are working together um, and how individuals are really instrumental in, in benefiting mm -hmm. their own communities. Yeah, I love that. And I love that that's such a, a really specific entry point for the Discovery Center as well, because you aren't really a collecting institution, mm -hmm. um, like the, a lot of the folks, uh, the other uh, panelists. And uh, I, I love that thought process and thinking about who, who isn't on the front page of the newspaper, who isn't kind of a buzz on people's Facebook posts, like what, what are, what is really kind of happening on the ground that a lot of people don't know about or aren't aware of. Yeah. And are there, did you have any specific thoughts, Charlotte, about who you might reach out to or kind of where did that start? Mm -hmm. What was some of your first sort of thoughts about who to reach out to or, or how to gather those stories? Yeah, absolutely. So we, as a team, we really started paying attention to what stories were starting to pop up um, in, in newspapers, online, wherever. And uh, there were a lot of, you know, young people and all ages of people doing things in their community. And we started collecting those. And then we started really looking at locally. We narrowed it down to um, our local partners and South Seattle Emerald um, is, is such an amazing organization. And was telling some really powerful stories. And so we reached out to Marcus Harrison Green um, with South Seattle Emerald to talk to him about a partnership. And that that partnership really involved 
uh, both story gathering and, and what were leads from the community, like having it be community led, that the community was, you know, putting names, uh, giving names to us as in, who were important individuals to look at because they were really doing a lot for their communities. And then that partnership continued to uh, Marcus doing the interviews with these individuals uh, and their photographers. So it's been That's an amazing so awesome. partnership. We, yeah. could, we couldn't have done it without them. I mean, it needs to be, you need to be in partnership with the community. Yeah, that's great. And, and shout out to South Seattle, South, ugh, South Seattle Emerald, a wonderful, wonderful um, online publication with incredible journalists. And I really enjoyed following their documentation um, of the pandemic as well. So. Mm -hmm. Shifting a little bit and thinking about all of your individual roles and what you do for your organizations um, pre pre pandemic, um, how has your work specifically been impacted by the pandemic, or what conditions were created or eliminated by the pandemic? Taya, did you want to? Do you want to kick us? With that one. Yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, I wear two hats. Um, so I'm the director of the CMAR Museum, but I'm also the uh, health center administrator, clinic manager of our teen medical clinic located in the same building. Um, as some of you may or may not know, CMAR, um, our parent organization, is a nonprofit community health center. And community health centers have been vital um, in, in the reaction and fighting against the pandemic. And you know, when the pandemic first hit, healthcare industry, the healthcare industry, community health centers, FQHCs, federally qualified health centers, hospitals, um, clinics, and other uh, healthcare nonprofits were activated pretty quickly. Um, and you know, the CDC and the Washington State Department of Health, you know, knew its pre-existing partners already, and so th those pipelines were in place. And our priority shifted at that point. CMAR Community Health Centers as an organization, our, the museum closed um, in March, you know, right when most other museums and, and public um, businesses were closing. But CMAR Community Health Centers stayed open. Um, so our clinic was open. Um, CMAR has more than 100 clinics throughout Washington State, uh, not just medical, but behavioral health and dental as well. And so that was our focus. So, you know, when um, I learned about the, the theme of this, uh, cafe, you know, documenting and collecting, we really didn't, the museum was closed, we were not focused on collecting the contemporary history of this moment, you know, we knew the significance of this moment, but our chief focus was in fighting against it. And so switch to telemedicine and telehealth, telehealth was a big shift. Um, and then when the vaccine became available, vaccinating became the main focus. And so the CMAR had been, CMAR museum had been closed for a number of months at that point, And when the vaccine was made available, the museum then hosted uh, vaccine clinics every day. Um, and so that was, it was in the same space. I like to tell our visitors, hey, you know, you, you don't have to sit in a boring waiting room. You know, your, your waiting room, <laughs> your exam room is our museum. Have a look at the exhibits while you're getting vaccinated. Um, and so our site uh, vaccinated over uh, just over 5,000. Um, the museum wow. is now open again. So our vaccination efforts are closed. All of their CMAR clinics are still offering the vaccine, booster shots, third doses, um, and pediatric Pfizer vaccine. But the CMAR museum itself is now open again. And so we're no longer hosting vaccine clinics within the museum. Um, but for a long time, that was our real goal. And the documentation that happened, happened incidentally through our education efforts. So as a community health center, we have a health education department, individual clinics have health educators and other positions whose main job is to communicate and battle against the misinformation around the COVID vaccine, um, misinformation and the learning curve involved in just what the COVID-19 was, um, how it was spread. And so, you know, the documentation that happened at that point were um, things like, you uh, you know, uh, commercials and ads being filmed um, at various clinics at our clinic um, in the museum and other CMAR sites combating against the misinformation um, being made a significantly focused on the Spanish speaking community of Washington state whose vaccine rates were lagging significantly behind um, other uh, groups within Washington state. And so that's where the, the documentation happened. But again, it wasn't, the goal of it wasn't primarily the long-term collection and mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. coalition coalition of of that information for with an exhibit in mind it was immediately you know it meant for the immediate combating of misinformation and the immediate sharing of of education about um the impacts that you, um, you may experience if you become infected with mm-hmm. covid vaccine if with um with covid 19 if you um have a family member who is tested positive how to get tested you know again these things there was a learning curve in learning how COVID-19 was transmitted. Um, mm-hmm. There's a learning curve in terms of, um, you know, the incubation process and all of those things. So that's where the, the collection yeah. and the health education, our focus really was. It was only once we were able to take a breather that we even kind of mm-hmm. thought, how do we want to tell this story in the future? Um, but even then, um, object collection has not been a focus at all. Um, mm-hmm. Information and story collection, um, we've started, but again, it's been incidental. Uh, one resource I do want to share, I just think it's so powerful, so I want to mention it right away. Um, it's an article from Seattle Times, and I know that we're going to make this uh, available um, at the end of the session, but there was an article in Seattle Times that um, a Tacoma physician, so the CMR Tacoma Clinic, there's a doctor there named Dr. John Ockrent, and he's also a poet. He's a doctor by day and a poet by night, and he, <laughs> that was how he started documenting the pandemic. He was he was writing wow. poetry and he shared it with a friend who ran Poetry Northwest and it was published and it wound up being the most seen and most visited um, poetry on their site since wow. their opening. Um, it's it's very, very powerful poetry. You know, again, that's just an insight into how the pandemic is being documented. Individual experiences mm-hmm. are being retained and being remembered in very specific, very individual ways. And some of those ways are, be, are being shared, you know, as poetry is being published. Um, and it's wonderful poetry. Again, I do want um, everyone to read it. It's really quite powerful. It's very reminiscent of um, uh, Leaves of Grass and Walt Whitman. That's very much okay. the style. Um, um, but, you know, that's that's where, you know, the, the stories and the experiences that, that we've seen from, you know, the, the client population of CMAR is initially are the you know, the mission of CMAR was meant to serve the Spanish speaking population, but then that expanded um, since the 1970s and our founding to include just serving the underserved and the underserved yeah. is an umbrella that covers many, many, many people. Yeah. Um, and the pandemic, the COVID pandemic has highlighted how many different people and groups are being underserved in so many different ways. Mm-hmm. And, and these are stories that are not new to this pandemic. Um, yeah. You know, you know, I, I, I heard um, a speaker talk about, you know, the twin pandemics of 2020, yes. you know, the, the yes. COVID pandemic and, and the pandemic of, of racism and, um, and being brought to a head. And it's nice to think that, you know, attention is now being brought to, to these issues and these experiences. But on another hand, it's also like, well, these experiences were being documented in other ways, but they yeah. maybe weren't getting the recognition that they needed. And, and even now it's, you know, I like to think, um, I'll stop talking very soon, but you know, there's something when thinking about how to document and share and collect this story initially in a pandemic that's still going on, I think about, you know, the first waves of optimism that were experienced by healthcare workers, mm-hmm. people on the front lines. So the first months, mm-hmm. you know, you saw those stories um, in newspaper papers about, you know, people, um, you know, honking their cars and clapping and waving from windows um, when healthcare workers are leaving hospitals. Um, and that, takes a lot of energy to sustain that type of enthusiasm. And unfortunately, yeah. that that energy went away because the pandemic is very draining for very yeah. many different reasons. And the healthcare workers and frontline workers then experienced that same exact energy drain, you know, wanting to, to help, wanting to support and quickly being burnt out. And I think along those lines, you can think about, you know, the, the passion for how to document this, this, these experiences that that's something that, you know, people I think can initially have, okay, that's this very, this is an exciting moment where we know this is something that everyone is very clearly able to see as, as Claire mentioned, is an important, significant moment in history. Oh, great. That's so wonderful. Usually sometimes people don't know that they're in that moment until afterwards. So now Mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's a signifier that people are able to identify, but you know, it's holding on to that, that feeling that, that energy boost is, is very, very difficult for so many different reasons. Um, But, you know, so those, that's the, the immediate impact that that we experienced at the CMAR Museum. Mm -hmm. Um, Thank you. Yeah, Yeah, thank you for that. Steph, I know you alluded to it a little bit, but um, how how has Black Heritage Society kind of been been impacted and and how has your work specifically um, been impacted? Right, well, obviously we're, um, 
you know, the workhorse of our organization is our collection and our archive um, being closed. I mean, I'm sure we all experience the the day to day or weekly protocol changes, you know, and who could access what, when, or how. And so our facility our, um, archive was closed for a number of months and we had to ease back into it with, you know, first um, one person, um, two hours, one day a week. And then now to where we have two staff people that are able to come in, but still no guests um, and people to actually come in and do research. We we have had a couple of opportunities where we've been able to get people in. So we had to shift too. We had to shift gears and um, figure out how we were going to respond to inquiries. We still wanted to be able to respond to people, let them know that we were we were there, and if there was any way that we could help them in collections by doing some of the research ourselves and then reaching back to them with that information. So we we tried to stay active. We still try to stay you know active that way. But again, um, I just want to make this point that um, it became pretty clear to us that collecting was not where our headspace was. We uh, were really being sensitive to the increased loss of life in our community, um, in our organization, even you know, close, really close to home for us and our community. And so, you know, we we just felt that um, if we could participate or help to facilitate conversation uh, between family members, um, um, maybe showing up at places like Wanawari that we're actually trying to host, you know, small events or virtual events, and even with Mohai, different events where people were actually having, you know, discussions around, you know, how they were surviving you know, through the pandemic. So we're still trying to figure it out, right? Um, and I hope that, that we'll be back soon um, and doors open to allow visitors to come in and do the research that they wanna do because we, we hold the, the largest public collection of African-American memorabilia in the state. Mm -hmm. So it's important, yeah. Yeah, thank you. And I think that's, an, that's a really important thing to reflect on is that so many people, even now, uh, are still in survival mode. So many organizations are still in survival mode and trying to figure out what's next. How do we continue to navigate um, interpersonally, organizationally, um, as you know, things are still changing, much less so, obviously, than uh, early on in the pandemic, but things are still changing. We're still learning new things. And um, I think the, the long-term effects of isolation, of dealing with such loss on a, on a, ma on a macro and micro level, um, I think people are still sort of navigating that and, and still figuring out what to do. <laughs> um, so thinking about the work that you all have done during the pandemic, what are some of your key takeaways? What, what things did you learn about either how your organization pivoted, could pivot, what, what was possible even during, especially during the lockdowns, I think when everyone just felt like, oh God, what are we going to do? Um, and has that impacted any of your long-term visions for your, your organization or, or how to operate moving forward? Um, Maybe Clara, you can start us off. It's interesting because I feel like paradoxically, so most of my job is usually working on site with our artifacts. So being mm -hmm. down for months and having a desk job in my apartment was very strange. And, um, but paradoxically like that, you know, I needed to come up with desk work. And writing the plan for how we were going to collect COVID-19 um, stories was something I could do from my desk. Um, we, I haven't, that plan hasn't unfolded exactly as we expected, of course, because it was sort of written in this, you know, in the kind of intense early pandemic when we thought it might be short lived and it was kind of a finite story to collect. But I, um, 
the way it was written is we sort of identified like four categories of things we wanted to collect. One, the first was sort of things that had to do with um, the early moments of the pandemic because Seattle was at one point the hotspot, right? We know now we probably weren't the first place it had landed in the US, but officially we were the first place. Um, stories about um, the medical field, innovations in medicine. Um, so initially it was just gonna be three. And so the third one was sort of everyday life. And I want to give credit to the Mohai Youth Advisors because they were, they were meeting on Zoom too. And I met with them and talked about the plan and said, is there any categories you think we're missing? And I wish I remember who it was, but one of them said, what about something about the way that sort of existing inequalities have been revealed by the pandemic? I was like, wow, that is spot on. So that went into the plan. And then, then it made it, as we've been saying, there was kind of, you know, the COVID was not the only thing that happened in 2020. And so then the plan was completely applicable to all of the other things that happened the rest of the year. Um, so I want to give strong credit to the Mohai Youth Advisors for um, including, so that ended up in our collecting plan. That's so amazing and, and so wonderful that you, one, that your uh, youth advisors were so involved and um, helped shape that. Uh, what a gift, what a gift. Uh, Charlotte. Yeah, um, well, similarly, in the sense that you don't know how long it's gonna go on. So you sort of do this short-term planning and then it starts to be more long-term planning. And I think once we realized it was gonna be a while, we realized we needed to pivot as much as we could to online, whether it was giving tours virtually, um, and I use tours meaning more like lessons uh, and our events and um, even our exhibits. So we had planned uh, uh, actually an HIV exhibit um, around living with stigma and it's story based also and uh, photography based. And so putting all of those things online was sort of the first thing. But then as we started thinking about the COVID experience, we really were thinking, okay, the foundation is investing dollars in fighting the disease, treating the disease, um, looking at some of these inequities locally and some grants locally. Um, but as, the, as a discovery center representing the foundation, but also um, community voices, we felt that it was really important to approach what would be online and then later in a physical exhibit with personal story and looking at that first person story of not only how the pandemic was affecting them, but also um, what they were doing in their communities uh, around the pandemic. And many of them, we started to look at the themes around the, the stories we were seeing out there and then theming them because we were seeing the stories about fighting and treating the disease. We were seeing themes around sharing joy and healing. We were seeing stories around what, how people were meeting their community needs with um, mutual aid and other things. Uh, we also saw ways that people were sharing information and really critical information. And then, and then there were the people that were going to work every day to keep us afloat, whether it was in um, childcare or it was collecting our garbage and so on. Um, so that's how we started to then theme the story collection so that we could really, um, start to make sense out of what these store, where these stories were coming from and how to group them because there's an enormous number of stories. I mean, that was one of the challenges is you have so many incredible things going on. How do you start narrowing that down? And, and we really started to localize it to this region because stories, you, you mentioned the, the ringing of bells and the you know clamoring when hospital workers came out. I mean, across the country, across the world, people are doing incredible things. So we really tried to keep it local um, for the online experience. I love that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to say thanks to, to Charlotte too. I just picked up on something that you said was about finding some joy too mm -hmm. in, in some of this, this space that, you know, um, you'd wake up every day. You, you didn't know what you were going to hear, what you were going to find out you know, um, depressing news, sad news. Um, so looking for joy and finding joy is really important in all of this, you know, for us. And 
I think that some of the lessons learned, um, again, for us at DHS was just expanding our sensibilities around, um, you know, what are the appropriate approaches to collecting? We, we knew what they were, but this time we were really being pressed and stressed in a way uh, that we hadn't before. So we know that our community is a really rich community. We have a lot of um, layered, we, we've talked about amongst ourselves about layers of stories and the events in this past year. And so sometimes I think it's not up to BHS to maybe pick and choose all of what we're preserving, but rather let the community speak to us about what is important so that in another 50 or even 100 years for those who are still around, um, you know, uh, what would they hope would be in this time capsule that we call BHS archives. Yeah, that's such an important thing to remember and that sometimes it's not about what maybe you individually or, your, or you as a representative of your organization thinks is going to be the thing to remember, but the, the folks that um, walk through your doors that come to see your exhibits, maybe it's what they want to remember how they want to remember this. So thank you. Um, thank you all so much for um, participating. Does anyone want to add any closing thoughts? Um, any Anything you'd like to share before we switch over to audience uh, q and I have one yeah. quick thing. <laughs> thank you. Um, this just, you know, this entire discussion, this entire uh, experience that the CMR Museum has experienced and that that all of us, I think, are experiencing at our respective organizations, um, does call to mind, you know, so pre-pandemic, the CMR Museum had only been open about three months. We had a very, very short <laughs> lifespan. We had to close right after opening. Um, and it was very sad. Um, but one thing that, you know, I was reflecting, I was going through all the materials that we had developed pre-pandemic, talking about the museum, thinking about presentations I had given pre-pandemic, um, the framework with, within which the Seymour Museum exists under this parent company is kind of an unusual structure, a community health center sponsoring a museum. And um, so the one of the co-founders of Seymour Community Health Centers, um, Rogelio Riojas, he, his, the Seymour Museum was his brainchild. Um, he has been a longstanding dream more than 15 years. And his, um, it wasn't adopted into our mission statement, but we use it as our concept statement. So we we use this quote in almost every presentation we give on the museum. And it was just the idea that the understanding we wanted to promote that educational, cultural, and heritage services play just as significant and impactful a role in the wellness and, and well-being and health of communities, individuals, as do medical, behavioral health, and dental services. And that you know, and that was that that thinking was just kind of the rationale behind, you know, that you could give as a response to someone saying, why is CMAR opening a museum? That seems like out of step. And they go, no, this is a very natural progression. We started with medical services. We continued with legal, educational housing, and now cultural services, heritage services. But it is very true. And I think that everything that has been discussed today is, has been, you know, with the underlying understanding that chronicling this experience is important and how we do that is going to differ and it's going to change and evolve but it's important and we all understand that and part of that understanding is that we know the importance and the impact that culture and, and heritage services can play in not just someone's experience but in their actual well-being um so that's kind of my i thought that, that was very timely mm -hmm. that thought yeah, I love that. Um, I think that you need to say that to all of our elected officials, Taya, about how important all of our work <laughs> and our organizations are to integral, in fact, to all of our health and wellness and well-being, because <laughs> I could not have said it better myself. Uh, that's that's fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. I think Charlotte, you would probably also agree with that too. <laughs> yeah, and I was I was gonna um, also say that I feel like we really um, have a responsibility to raise the the voices that well, like I said before, but also the global issues that we're that we're all facing because we are all connected. And if we don't start looking at 
these as a global, um, with a global perspective, we're, we're going to continue where we are right now. And so um, I know, Clara, you had mentioned the inequities piece, and that is part of the interviews that we have is really asking point blank, what, what are the inequities that have been exasperated or exposed? Um, what barriers were you facing um, during COVID as, as well as what they have been doing and where they have hope? Um, and, and what's next? Like, where are we going to go from here? Because it's not over and we're learning to live with it. And, and how is that going to then trans continue to transform our lives? And we're, we're not the same as two, almost two years ago. And mm -hmm. we, we need to keep looking closely at this and acting on it. So I think that's mm -hmm. the other perspective as we move forward. Um, and we will be making ours a physical exhibit eventually when we open. <laughs> Great. I look forward to seeing it. I think we're going to switch gears a little bit. There's a couple of questions from the audience uh, that I'd love to ask you. They're very good questions. Um, I think, um, Taya, you alluded to this, but I'd love to hear uh, from other folks um, if you've had this experience, but the first question that we got uh, is, have you encountered materials or people who talk about the pandemic from a very partisan and maybe actually challenged viewpoint? How did you address this uh, in your work? So I see Clara, you're laughing. Tell us, tell us, tell us. Oh, uh, I, I feel like, well, I, I, Taya was nodding, so I was kind of responding to that, but uh, we haven't had, um, we, we haven't had things that were sort of anti-vaccine or conspiracy theory type stuff that's come in our, what we've been offered. I would say the one kind of interesting thing that we've gotten more of this year in offers, it's not all pandemic related, but what I kind of refer to as like secondary source artifacts. And what I mean by that is like, yes, we learn about history. You know, it's like, oh, your primary sources is like your newspaper articles, your letters, and the secondary sources, the people interpreting it. And we've gotten artifacts that are like themselves interpreting events. And so what I mean by that is like art pieces that are like, there was one that we were offered that was like combined sort of stories of COVID with AIDS, with polio, with, you know, that was like kind of an artistic and it was kind of, it was very like, we're keep, we keep repeating the past. We're like not paying, you know, that this is these pandemics and we're not listening to mm -hmm. this was kind of the message. And it was really interesting, but it was kind of like, is this a, you know, it's representing an emotion that has to do with the mm -hmm. pandemic, but it's also like already doing that interpretive work of like taking a stance and, and that usually with, I mean, museums are not neutral, but we try to be the ones who are like, how are we telling the story with the primary sources? And so yes. wrestling yes. with how to like, do we take artifacts that are kind of already have a very clear sort of interpretive point of view? It's not, mm. just, it's like, this is the mm -hmm. one has. Um, so that's that's kind of the closest we've had to wrestle with. Do we take those kinds of artifacts? Um, yeah. yeah. Anyone else want to take a stab at responding to that one? I don't know if Charlotte or Stephanie, you encountered any of that. No, we haven't, we haven't had any experiences like that, you know, at all. Um, I think more than anything um, this last year, we've seen more people step up to want to become members and show us that Black Lives Matter, you know, than anything else. So um, contacting us or wanting to, um, you know, bring things to our collection, no, nothing, nothing negative or even mm -hmm. on a positive note. Taya, did you want to add anything? Um, so the experiences that we've had with partisan opinions about, for example, the vaccine um, have come from patients and come during vaccine events. So we haven't had anything in terms of responses from uh, museum goers or uh, people who are looking to share, influence, argue with um, our museum and our museum's mission. So our museum's mission does include the phrase, you know, through a social justice lens, looking at the experience and stories of the Latinx Chicanx uh, community in Washington state. And so we already have that focus and that 
that understanding. Um, and but we haven't had any anyone express any. Again, the 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 main people that we've had have been people who are at our site either seeking the vaccine or protesting the vaccine. Um, we've had that, but that hasn't been on the museum side. That's been on the clinic side. And that's that's a whole different bandwagon. That's a whole different yeah. conversation. Um, yeah. But again, that's where our educational services that's combating the misinformation has been the hardest thing. Um, mm -hmm. That's been what's taken up the most bandwidth of, of everyone. And it's it's very sad to see it's impacted the Latinx community significantly. Um, the misinformation that spread through Spanish language and social media mm -hmm. um, has been particularly impactful in a very negative way. Um, and so, you know, combating against that has been where a lot of uh, CMAR community health centers resources have gone, but we haven't seen any any response to the CMAR museum. Um, yeah, and I'm a sure follow -up that's coming. Question to that. Yeah, a follow up question to that is, um, and you probably don't have a real answer for this now. But I'm personally curious, are you going to like keep any of that? Are you going, do you have any plans to interpret that or carry that into the future, just even maybe broadly speaking about the whole concept of misinformation um, or, so yeah. the, We haven't um, had any long-term discussion about um, kind of big picture interpretation or exhibits around misinformation as a whole, but what, funnily enough, you know, the, the stories and experiences that we're experiencing on the community health center side are, are being documented and collected by us in various ways that are maybe non traditional, but we have them, we have access to them, um, and they're ready to be transmitted to the museum side of things fairly quickly. But, you know, one part of our, our mission is to tell the story of, um, you know, Latinx owned and operated and founded organizations and businesses. And one of the stories we tell is the history of the CMAR Community Health Center organization, which was founded in 1978 to serve the Spanish speaking population in Seattle. It expanded um, all the way down to Marysville, which is where C and MAR comes from, C for Seattle, MAR for Marysville. But it's extended beyond that. And, you know, funnily enough, telling the story of the pandemic through the experience of CMAR Community Health Centers is a very clear interpretive next step. We don't have to do any <laughs> creative interpretation yes. to include that story. That's if it's it's yes. honestly just the chronological approach would take us there. And then mm -hmm. from there, the work that we're doing is battling misinformation and that brings up all these bigger issues. Um, so funnily enough, our overall mission actually umbrellas under it the pandemic in a very strange way. <laughs> yeah, so we absolutely. don't actually have to do a lot of interpretive legwork, um, which is which is kind of funny to realize. <laughs> yeah. That, that's, a, I guess, a, a happy accent, a happy bonus. Um, yeah. And I'd have to say shout out to Mohai for their uh, democracy exhibition and that section on combating uh, misinformation and, and media literacy. I loved that. And I thought that was so helpful. Um, and I deeply appreciate Mohai for, for going there and including that. Um, I thought that was a really important part of that exhibition. So thank yeah. you. And I think we we tend to stick to the science. I mean, that's we're mm -hmm. more of a science based organization. So rather than trying to combat the criticism, it's just sticking to the the data, as you want to call it, around what is working and and how lives are being saved. Um, and and we because we're not open, we haven't had the in person dynamics around that. Um, there's plenty online that you can people can see about the foundation. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious, Charlotte, have you encountered anything in your interactions with online programs or anything like that? No, in fact, we have had um, an uptick in our engagement with especially schools. And one of the most popular, there, there's a choice of, class, of lessons you can choose from. And we have three or four different COVID ones. We, we keep adding them. We started with two, then we had three, now we have four. Um, and that's one of the most popular choices. Um, so two of them are on the science of COVID. One of them is more on the creative, like um, more mm. of a, a healing exercise of drawing mm -hmm. and writing around how it's affecting you. And then I'm embarrassingly blanking on the other one, <laughs> but uh, it's all online. Yeah, um, that's great. But we have not had it from, from the public at events or with our lessons. Very, very cool. So we have another audience question, uh, which is how has your experience in this pandemic made you think differently about the items, stories, 
photos that have been preserved from the 1918 flu pandemic? Has it made you want to preserve particular things from this pandemic? That's a great question. Right, it, it is a good one. And I know that I've um, talked to, to Clara and I've heard her speak on this as well as that in 19, from 1918, we didn't collect much. I mean, there isn't much in our collections, um, you know, for people to go back and reflect. So I think that's why uh, we were in such a hurry to, to begin collecting now until, you know, we had to stop in our track and reevaluate, you know, where we at and where we were going. So at the Black Heritage Society, I would say that when we, we first started looking into our collections to see um, if we could find anything, there might've been one or two references and like a legacy collection from a family that mentioned someone who had become ill, but other than that, nothing. No. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I second that. I think uh, what Clara brought up in, in our, our prep meeting for this, um, you know, the fact that there aren't a lot of items <laughs> from the 1918 pandemic across, uh, you know, across institutions across the country. Um, and that does raise, you know, the, the thought that, you know, part of that may be that people who experienced that didn't want to remember it. It was very traumatic. And that brings home that not necessarily all significant historical moments that people are aware of in the moment, which are, um, you know, not all of them are necessarily traumatic. You know, some of them are, are of brief enough duration that whatever trauma there is, it it, it may not stifle the, the collecting impulse or the, the narrative driving impulse. Um, and then there are other incidents and experiences that are of a longer standing nature. And the trauma of that makes it a lot more difficult for people to even want to chronicle their own experiences, let alone share them. And mm -hmm. that's something that I think has been brought home by the pandemic too. Um, people aren't necessarily ready to talk about this. I think I mentioned this at our, at our prep meeting, but you know, there were, you know, books and documentaries that were made mm -hmm. relatively early in the pandemic about how did we get here? How did this happen? And I was not ready for them. There was a documentary. I think Alex Gibb ma Gibbs made a documentary um, pretty early on in the pandemic about basically just how did we get here medically, speaking as a, you know, from the standpoint of the, the U.S. nation and the CDC and Department of Health, and I was not ready to watch that. It was such an anxiety-inducing documentary. I wasn't ready. There was a book called The Premonition, a wonderfully, um, you know, researched book uh, about the same thing, chronicling the experiences of public health professionals, public health doctors, and again, it was so anxiety-inducing that I was like, I'm not, I'm not ready for, to gain this type of perspective and to, <laughs> and to follow these types of stories because it's still too, it's still too fresh. Um, so that's just a, yeah. something I wanted to share. Yeah, and it's interesting to think about because some of the few things that I have seen that were, uh, that are floating around that various institutions collected from the 1918 pandemic, my, my mind is like, why aren't we talking about this more? Some of the, the same approaches that actually helped, you know, call the spread of the, the 1918 flu, like the, these same things existed in 1918. And I feel like for so many people, this feels so new and it feels like completely strange territory. In a lot of ways it is. I think there are a lot of things from that time that are still really useful if not only just to tell people this is not you. <laughs> these are some of the things that people did back then that helped. Um, these are actually some of the things that change the way modern medicine is approached. Um, you know, things like infectious diseases change the way hospitals were designed. I mean, there's a lot of really powerful information even from these little bits of jobs that we've collected. So my historian heart is just like, no, we should save stuff. This is going to be really important because this isn't going to be our last pandemic. This pandemic's not even over yet. And I think a lot of people are already like, well, when, what are we going to do for the next one? Um, and I think thinking about it from that perspective, um, you know, but also as many of you said, just balancing, you know, people have gone through a very traumatic experience and, you know, figuring out the timing, um, figuring out the questions to ask, figuring out, you know, how to kind of approach the subject are all really um, important things to think about. Um, I think that I have 
those are all of the audience questions we got. Anybody else who's with us this evening, please feel free to share any additional questions that you have for the panelists. Um, but if you don't see anything, I think that we can um, wrap up. Again, I will give the floor to any of our panelists, our wonderful panelists, uh, to share any closing thoughts that you all have. Um, I appreciate all four of you. You're all doing incredible work out in the world. I'm honored and privileged to know you all uh, individually, um, even before this event. And I was very excited to bring you all together just for the very wide, and broad perspective that you all bring to this conversation. Um, so yeah, feel free to add anything, any closing thoughts. I just want to thank the storytellers in our case. Um, you know, it's not easy to tell a personal story and there's a vulnerability and exposure there. And I have so much gratitude and appreciation for them being willing to share their story and also for what they're all doing um, to make our lives better. So just a huge thank you. And, and thank you to all of you for what you do too. It's an honor. Yes, thank you, Taya. Round of applause for all of you. Um, and I will turn it back over to Rachel from Moha. Thank you again to all of you. It was wonderful to see you all and wonderful to be in this conversation with you. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie, for your wonderful moderation. And thank you, Clara, Charlotte, Stephanie, and Taya for all your brilliant insights and for helping us start to reflect on, I don't know, is it too soon? I, I have to say I wanted to do this program last year and it felt too soon. So I'm glad we're having this conversation now. Like I had that thought, you know, I, I was like, I don't think I'd want to go to that. I don't think the audience would either. So I think that's a really good point um, of when it's time to reflect and be interesting to see where we are as things continue to continue. So thank you all for all that you've shared. And thank you so much to our partners at History Link um, for uh, making History Cafe possible. Uh, we so appreciate you, our audience, for coming. If you can, please take a moment to answer a few questions about the program by following the link that will be put in the chat. We'll also email that to you as well um, so that we can continue to bring you the best in regional history programs. Um, also, just a reminder that History Cafe will be taking a break for December, so don't plan to log on. We won't be here in Zoom, um, but do come back in January. On January 19th, we're going to be having um, uh, speaker Paul Kidder talking about the Seattle architect um, Minoru Yamasaki, um, so that will be fun. Please come. Also, um, never fear, there's no History Cafe, but we are doing a program in December, our very own uh, Clara Berg, who is on the call, <laughs> and will be speaking again on December 11th uh, from five, four to five on um, some of our fun party clothes from the collection. Uh, part of the reason this was picked was thinking about having a year where there was not a lot of partying, where partying had to be done from home, so a chance to celebrate uh, some of our fun formal wear. And uh, lastly, if you learn something new or enjoy the work we do, please consider making a gift or becoming a member to support future programs and help sustain the museum beyond the impact of the pandemic, which has had a very real impact on us as well as all the organizations here represented. Um, and if you have not visited or heard about the organizations of uh, speakers represented please go see them now that places are starting to open. Go visit the online exhibits where you can go look through online collections. We are so lucky to have so many wonderful historical and heritage um, organizations in this area. Um, so thank you and have a lovely rest of your evening. Stay warm, stay dry, and we'll see you online and hopefully at the museum soon. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you.